Wayfeather Media presents Claire Voyaging. Hey! <laughs> Hello. How's it going? Well, what do you think? I don't know. I don't know anymore. It's fine. We'll, well say it's fine. That's exciting. <laughs> um, what's new, Frank? Oh, nothing. We, um... We both had some uh, wardrobe malfunctions today for some upcoming weddings. Yeah, I had a, a lot of nip slips. <laughs> that When you say wardrobe malfunction, that's the only thing I think of. <laughs> that's true. Our clothes weren't, like, falling off or something. Listen, here's the truth. I fatted out of a suit, <laughs> and Lauren went to a tailor who, like, did the reverse of a tailor. So you messed up my dress a little bit. So. We're not going to out anybody. No, we're not. But, but man, some some material was just like getting ruffled and we were mad. Material and feathers. Yeah. Here, here, this is our complaint cast. Yeah, here it is. Hey, um, Lauren. Yeah. Any updates? Yeah. So here's this. We'd like to thank our newest supporter on Buy Me a Coffee. What? Yeah. Gargantua Jones Borb Jr. bought us some coffees. Thank you, Gargantua. <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> gargantua it's supporters like you if you want to support the show go to buymeacoffee.com slash clairvoyaging and we'll give you a shout out just like we did for gargantua no matter what your name is <sighs> okay what else is up we had some fascinating guests with us this week we i did. think we did um i think you are just plucking People straight from your favorite podcast, one of your favorite podcasts called the Night Owl Podcast. I am. Yeah, we had Sarah Reeves, and this time we've got uh, two more guests from that are featured on that podcast. But um, if you don't know what the Night Owl Podcast is and you like investigations surrounding haunted locations, check it out. It's like we're just pitching this podcast and the host doesn't know about it. We might as well <laughs> tell him, by the way, we've been like, selling your podcast pretty hard but anyway they do deep dive investigations with mediums and people that do house cleansings witchcraft stuff like that and featured pretty often on that show are the guests that we have for today's episode it's alexis arredondo and eric labrado who are founders of a shop in austin texas called city alchemist yeah they are they are co-authors of two books, which they will discuss, mm -hmm. and they have tons of knowledge surrounding Santeria, witchcraft, and Mexican folk magic. They taught us a lot. They taught us a lot. I don't I had know. No, I didn't know what any of those things were. Yeah. I'm in the dark. Lauren's in the void. We're very, very. It's so dark. I can't see. <laughs> um, but yeah, they taught, like, I think there's a lot of assumption around things like santeria or if you hear the word witchcraft you just think it's bad mm -hmm. or if you heard like mexican folk magic just not knowing what something is people have a bad connotation with things or like a ooh, stay away from that but they're lovely wonderful people and they like we had a nice time talking to them and we learned a lot and we hope you do too enjoy Gentlemen, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Thank, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Uh, usually with, with this thing, we, we just ask everybody to introduce themselves in, in your own words and, and just give us a little background on how you got started and in, in what your current expertise is. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Alexis Arredondo. Um, I'm from South Texas originally and um, kind of grew up uh, with like the legends of South Texas, the stories of witches and healers known as curanderos and i grew up about 30 miles from a very famous healer known as don perito jaramillo back in the early 1900s and so very much enamored with that ever since a very young age and then it just kind of never went away just continued wanting to know more about it um eventually starting to learning the practice of curanderismo and healing as well as brujeria and um, then i met eric in 2011 um ish here in Austin, and we realized that we had very similar ideas of the of the way we kind of grew up and the things that we in, enjoyed about spirituality and magic, and um, started City Alchemist, wrote a few books, and that's kind of where we're at now. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, 
So my name's Eric. My name's Eric Labrado. Uh, I grew up in El Paso, Texas. Um, I share a pretty similar story to Alexis. Um, my family, specifically my maternal side, my mom's side, um, kind of raised me in in this sort of like folk practices like curanderismo and hechicería, and I was uh, really encouraged to explore, to develop. Um, uh, I guess just learning more about these sorts of things and guided by them as well. Um, yeah, like Alexa said, we met in Austin and uh, wrote two books. I think it's the first book. They're the first books on English re regarding uh, Mexican folk magic. And we started City Alchemist in 2020. That's awesome. And just for anybody who doesn't know, what is the City Alchemist? It is a metaphysical supply shop. Here, based in Austin, Texas, so we sell things like candles, incense, tarot. Uh, we have really good readers there, and we just try to be an, uh, a resource for the community, um, specifically cater to you know all sorts of traditions. So we're pretty eclectic, and we like to uh, kind of help people find their their path. If we don't know the answer, then we probably know somebody that will we can guide them to. That's awesome, and. I know what the city alchemist is because <laughs> I'm a fan of the night owl podcast. I've listened to every single episode. Um, and we just recently uh, interviewed Sarah who is an amazing person. I know yeah. she's not necessarily on the show anymore. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. She left. Um, right now we're actually doing this really cool thing where we're bringing in like guest mediums. Um, so it's really cool because it's not just uh, having mediums who will, like hit on things, but also like trying different mediums out and see what each one picks up. Mm. Oh, and that's cool. See how, we'll get like one medium who picks up exactly like one thing. And then this other medium comes in and picks up the exact something of something else. And it's, it's, it's been really, really fun. That's like a puzzle piece. Like I'm sure there's like missing pieces, you know, from one medium to another. That's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And just to clarify, we're talking about Sarah Reeves, who was our, Sarah Reeves, our, sorry. yeah, our, our guest on episode 12 and she's amazing. <laughs> she's good people. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I expected just to have a nice conversation about as normal as this kind of stuff gets. And she ended up like teaching me a lot about myself and I was <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. expecting that, but maybe I should have. You guys are both familiar in, in Mexican folk magic. Is that right? Are you both of Mexican descent? Correct. Yeah. Like Eric was saying, we're the first, um, uh, our books are the first books written by people of Mexican descent in English uh, about the practice of Mexican witchcraft, as far as we know. Um, there are other books out there uh, about Mexican witchcraft in English, but ours uh, is the first by pe basically people of Mexican descent, as well as um, the practice of how to actually do it, not just about it or like a like a scientific study. So the first one is called Magia, Magia, Invoking Mexican Magic. Uh, magia is just the Spanish word for magic. Um, and then the second one is Blood of Brujeria, uh, and that one is more baneful magic they call it a baneful magic text which we never intended it to be when we wrote it okay so this is a good jumping off point one of the reasons why we created this podcast in the first place is because uh, um we have a uh, younger family member who started having undeniably psychic experiences we noticed in kind of managing that that there's aren't a lot of resources out there and having grown up Catholic myself, the amount of fear surrounded by any of these topics is it's potent. And I want to make sure that we're in a place where we are educating our listeners and making sure that we're dispelling some of the the negativity that these practices don't necessarily deserve. So, I mean, I just I went to New Orleans recently. They're so into voodoo. And I noticed that, you know what, voodoo isn't actually all of that a bad thing. But like if you ask any bit about voodoo, like you're, you're, you're normie out there, they're going to be like, Hey, don't even talk about that stuff. And I know same thing with Santeria. I have a, I have a Cuban background. My dad is from Cuba and that's a four letter word as far as they're concerned. And I want to know, like, from your perspectives, what is the, the Mexican folk magic? What is the, the Mexican folk witchcraft? And like, what is Santeria? And I know that's a, a loaded question, but <laughs> Make this not scary for people. <laughs> but like, read our book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, without giving it. No spoilers. No spoilers. Um, I mean, I know Eric can definitely talk on Santeria. He is a Santero, so he can definitely speak on that. Um, as, you know, we're both from the border, so we understand this because it's uh, Mexican magic is just part of our culture. A lot of people don't even realize they're doing it. 
uh, to be perfectly honest, the same people that would probably say it's evil or it's, you know, stay away from it are the same people that are pretty much practicing it. You know, we had people growing up that would cleanse or cleanse each other with eggs or they would um, oh, I've heard do that. certain things, with the rosary, like putting a rosary by the bed or putting a rosary in a glass of water and things like that. And not realizing that that is Mexican folk magic. It's not just something that, you know, we do because we saw it in a movie or something like that. It was literally passed down generation to generation. So um, folk magic, I think, is the biggest way to look at it, or what we call hechiceria. It's like folk magic, mm -hmm. because it is something that is passed down generation to generation, something that's passed down from person to person even, like, oh, you know, take an egg and cleanse yourself, or, um, you know, put this thing over the door, the saint over the door, and it'll keep you protected, or, um, oh, your your daughter won't, you know, can't get pregnant or won't have a boyfriend, uh, hang St. Anthony upside down and and she'll find a boyfriend, you know, and people do it not because it's, you know, dark or archaic, but it's because they, they'll try it. They're going to try anything. Sure. Right. So we always tell people, you know, it's funny, like many people will be 100%, you know, Catholic or Christian or conservative, but when the time comes, they'll come see us. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> You know, Isn't that um, how it is? So yeah. The same way in New Orleans voodoo, I feel, in the same way in, in Haitian voodoo and a few other traditions. Um, but when it comes to Santeria, I mean, and, and Mexican magic as well, Eric, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. So I, I, I personally feel that practices like Santeria, Mexican Coranderismo specifically, help us navigate a chaotic world. So we are given and we understand within these systems that we are not the only ones um, inhabiting this this world. So we have deities, we have spirits, ancestors, earth spirits as well, that are all on different levels of elevation, um, understanding and development. So with Santeria and Coranderismo, Coranderismo is Mexican folk healing, um, it allows us to really um, be aligned with our authentic selves, right? And helps us um, be directly on our path, meaning that um, we are living out our destiny, right? So if you strip away everything in Santeria specifically, we're really looking at, um, are we living to our fullest potential, right? So in Santeria, you are in alignment with certain energies, certain deities, which we call Orishas, right? Uh, and these energies, these, these deities, they protect us. They remove things from our path. They help us manifest things that are, are within our destiny. And I would say the same thing applies to Kurambarismo as well. It helps us align our body, mind, and spirit. So we're, um, you know, able to just, like I said at the beginning, really navigate this chaotic world. Just a little bit of help, you know? So is Santeria considered because I really don't know very much about it at all is it oh, hold on you, Lauren doesn't practice Santeria <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh but here it comes and she doesn't have a crystal ball are we no but if <laughs> she had a million it, dollars but yeah. uh, <laughs> listen oh, uh, yeah. I, I wanted to make sure I brought everybody down a little bit yeah yeah I'm sure you don't hear yeah, the song lyrics quoted very often right <laughs> Continue, please. Uh, yeah, we hear it all the time. Sorry. Uh, he can't help himself. I'm sorry about him. So is it like more ritual type stuff? Is it more on like a religious? Like, how would you categorize it? Is that That's a really good question. I think personally, I cannot speak for everybody, but I would think about it or I would probably term it a spiritual path, spiritual practice as opposed to a religion. Okay. Um, I mean, it is definitely a religion in its own right, because we do have a corpus of, it's not really literature, but it's uh, it's an orally transmitted uh, belief system, basically, right? But the reason I feel like it's more of a spiritual practice is because you, it really helps us develop a relationship to, again, our authentic selves and a connection to our personal deity, our personal Orisha. So we become uh, protected, like I said, protected by them. But, but you know, rituals should not be happening every day. These are usually when 
you know, we want to bring a certain elements into our life, whether it's, you know, a fresh start, a business, um, uh, children, et cetera. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah. that's why we would implore those style of rituals. Yeah. Is there an <laughs> California, like American version of an Orisha? Is that something that is there like maybe another term for that that is that I don't know more translated to like Catholicism or, or people of Christian faith or Judaism or anything else or is that is this <laughs> I say California That's because a good question. yeah I think if we had to maybe and this is just you know me speaking um, I think if we had to maybe compare it to something I would probably compare it to an angel okay 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 That's what I was. That's what I was looking for, because that's kind of what it sounded like to me. Yeah, I was going to ask, because like... It's pretty complex, though, right? Orishas are ancestors, they're elemental spirits, they're kings and queens, they've lived on this earth. Some of them have, some of them haven't. It's, there's just a... Um, they're, 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 they are in their own category, basically. Okay. Are they separate from, yeah. like, your spirit guides, like, your spirit team? Is that, or are they kind of yes. in that category? Okay, so they're separate. Like, are they specifically like assigned to you, or can everyone kind of talk to the same Orisha? So, good question. Believe it or not, we believe before you come and incarnate on this world, in this world, you actually choose your Orisha. So, you even you two have personal Orishas. Okay. And That's they cool. are discovered, right, in uh, divination. We don't guess, we don't assume. This is why this uh, the spiritual path, this religion is is quite strong because everything is done via divination. We have to find out first. There's no guessing. Hmm. And how do you do that? Yeah, what's the what are the common divination practices? Yeah. So there's there's three common types of divination within Santeria. You have at the you, you have um, Ifa, which is kind of its own class, right? Um, most commonly employed would be Ifa, or in, specifically for me in my house, my Ile, we would use cowrie shells, which we called uh, we we call Delogun, right? So that is an oracle using um, cowrie shells. What kind of shells? The last, yeah, cowrie shells. If you look it up, you, you're like, oh, I know what that is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You've seen them like on surfer, like surfer necklaces, things like that. Oh, okay, okay. And then the last form of divination would be called uh, OB. In Santeria, we specifically use coconut to um, four pieces of coconut to ask yes or no questions, but specifically to understand and you know see who your Orisha is, you would use a uh, delogun or ifa. Man, you, you guys grew up with shells. It sounds like I had a magic eight ball, and it's just not as cool. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's yeah. cool. It usually, like, usually it breaks half the time. Have you ever watched somebody doing like the Laguna Rifa? It's so intricate and complicated that you're just like, wow, this is like a form of divination that very few people will actually know and, and know how to do it correctly. Yeah. And it's it's nothing like any divination you've ever seen, really, not even tarot cards. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna ask how separated are <laughs> like tarot cards versus versus the shells. Very, very separated. So very separated. so separated. <laughs> like not yeah. even close. Because, yeah, it seems like well, anybody know, can learn how to read tarot, but this sounds way more Yeah, complex. but even tarot is very, uh, yeah, well, tarot is actually very complex, right? It depends yeah. on how far you take it. Right. Do you have one Orisha? Um, so in Lukumi, Santeria, we have one Orisha that is, uh, we are initiated to, but we would have uh, technically a mother and a father, right? So there's female and male Orishas. And it doesn't matter what your gender is or anything like that. Um, you will always have two male Orishas. So if me, for instance, I'm initiated to the Orisha Oshun, which is female. So I also have a counterpart to that, which is male. And that will be Ogun. So technically you can say two, but even if you don't get initiated, you will have one. Oshun has seen a lot of popularity within the last couple of years. Um, She's definitely a complex Orisha. Mm -hmm. um, typically, when people start understanding and start reading about Santeria, they come to associate her with uh, the river, sweet things in life, honey, uh, vanity, beauty, love, sexuality, etc. Right? You got the good one. But, well, the more you develop within the religion, you understand that they're complex, just like we're complex. Mm -hmm. So we have many faces, right? We, we, we walk many paths. So Oshun is also a warrior. 
She's also um, a businesswoman. She's also a mother. So these Orishas, it's it's better not to think of them so one-dimensional because they have, again, many sort of uh, paths. Oh, this is very interesting. I, yeah, I, I have, n- have never heard of any of this. No, me neither. It's mm-hmm. very, it's fascinating. Again, growing up in like a split household where I'm definitely more white than Cuban, um, as far as like <laughs> cu- culturally <laughs> associated, I w- always got like, I've heard of throwing shells. I didn't know what it was called. But again, like the context was always pretty bad. When does this dive into what everyone is so associating with with darker stuff, what's the darker end of this that that everyone's so afraid of? The well, when it comes to Santeria, it's it's mostly like um, one of the biggest stigmas I think, or or thing that people shy away from is that it does require animal sacrifice for ceremonies and its rituals. Got it. But when we see that, immediately we think of you know uh, '80s satanic panic and all these right. horrible images in your head. Yeah. Um, we don't think about the fact that, uh, you know, if you go to McDonald's, your chicken nuggets were literally a whole <laughs> bunch of hundreds of chickens spread on a line where their heads cut off yeah. really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, That's a great whereas point. Whereas if you, if you ever actually do watch a Santeria ceremony, the, the chicken is cared for, it's fed, it's given water, um, it is actually bathed uh, ritually, it is killed ritually, bled ritually, and then eaten um, so if you think about it from the perspective of like, if you go, you know, to the store here, there's hundreds of chickens ready processed for you. If you go to a place like Nigeria, where the tradition of Santeria comes from originally, they don't have that. So they have to literally grab a chicken, kill the chicken, process the chicken. But in this tradition, let's kill the chicken, offer its life to our deity, because without them, we cannot continue. And then we are also going to eat that offering as part of our ceremony. So I think that that's where we probably see the biggest like darkness aspect of it. Sure. And then of course, just like any other African traditional religion, um, there is witchcraft in, in Santeria. There is witchcraft in, in these traditions as well. There's like, there's witchcraft in every community, pretty much all over the world. There's yeah. some form of witchcraft. And uh, yeah, that's funny. So we're just making dinner here and we're just, thank- <laughs> we're just also thanking our Orisha. This makes sense. Basically. That yeah. makes sense where, yeah, where like one story follows another and like it grows into fear. Like well, you hear yeah. like they're doing this and then it's like, well, that's scary. Yeah. And then you don't know about it. You don't learn about it. And it's just becomes this like uh, fear of the unknown, yeah. mm-hmm. the classic as usual. And I, and I think also as well, you touch upon something that somebody uh, and these and these traditions that develop in Africa are very secretive because you have to be initiated to participate there is no outsiders coming in and participating in certain rituals Um, you would have to have received something to see something or to engage in something you have to receive something first before you can see how that ritual is done sure so everything is very secretive it's 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 initiatory based right yeah we have our elders who have um been passed along these oral traditions for many, many, many years, generations. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're supposed to be baptized in Catholicism as well. Well, I mean, with Reiki, you're supposed to oh, have yeah. an attunement. Right. Like someone mm-hmm. is the one yeah. that like gives you, you know, access or whatever. Like, yeah. That's we would say the same thing probably in a Mexican Guaranderismo to some extent, even Hechiceria, which is like magic and sorcery and Brujeria as well, which is witchcraft. So you say this, you see the same thing. It's 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 passed on from generation to generation. That's why these traditions are called living traditions. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, Eric. Does all of your family practice, or like, how does that work uh, as far as like mm-hmm. generations go, or like with you specifically? Mm-hmm. Specifically in Santeria, I am the first one that knocked on the door, as okay. they say, yeah. and went in. Right um, for Guaranderismo. I do have family members that practice as well. Um, like I'm sure many Chicano, Mexican-American and Mexican people have had you know, family members somewhere down the line that have practiced. Are you, you're a medium too? Uh, yeah, Alexis and I are both mediums. Oh, we you both are. Spirits. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Alexis is very much one as well. Um, you know, there's different types of mediums and my, I, I come from a family that uh, are mediums as well. So I grew up a lot with mediumship in my family. Oh, wow. That's awesome. The, 
I mean, it sounds like you, you came from a family that is uh, more open to this type of thing. Did you have yeah. any like negative connotations you had to work through when you were growing up with your mediumship ability? Or when did your mediumship ability actually present itself? For me specifically, I one of my first memories, to be quite honest with you, was, was seeing spirits. Mm. And I don't see them anymore, but I can um, see them in my mind's eye and I can feel them and I can get messages directly from them. But really, my mediumship probably started about my development, I should say, probably started about 13, like 15 years ago. I lived in San Antonio for a while, San Antonio, Texas. And um, there's a lot of stuff that goes down <laughs> in San Antonio. Oh, really? So I started uh, learning from people there. Yeah. Anywhere there's a large Hispanic Latino population, there's some stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Alexis? Uh, with me, um my mediumship definitely as a kid there was some weird stuff here and there sensing stuff i didn't even know i was uh, i found out many years later that i was grown i did grow up in a haunted house and oh. um it was always this one area like i was always afraid of this one room which oddly enough was our like room where we kept all our toys but i was always afraid of that room and then i found it many many years later that um there there was a spirit that was usually seen there uh so never really encouraged i didn't get the the uh you know the, like oh yes be a medium and you know you can see spirits or anything like that as growing up um not for my parents at least i did have an uncle that did kind of practice a lot of these traditions um but very very quietly and privately then as i continued it wasn't until about 2003 so about 20 21 years ago or so um that i started connecting with uh, a mexican folk saint known as santa muerte a very popular mexican folk saint and that's kind of how I started developing more of my practice with uh, brujeria, hechiceria, and curandarismo. And then from there, my path just kind of continued even more so uh, until until now. And now I'd say in the more recent years, has my mediumship hit a higher level, um, working with the podcast, working with clients, uh, with students even, and then doing readings and things along those lines and helping people on those aspects. That's definitely how it's expanded more these days. Oh, wow. So it's like, yeah, it's been developing. It's been a journey um, because uh, I've even found like, I think it wasn't until about maybe three years ago, I've always used cards, uh, not tarot cards. I actually use Loteria cards, like Mexican bingo cards, oh. Um, oh. because I grew up playing Mexican bingo with my family. And so I would see these cards consistently and I kind of started developing a connection to working with them as a way of reading. And um I find myself using the cards mostly as a jumping off point now. So I, the card kind of gives me like the general symbol and now the message is kind of just kind of flow through. Um, but it was very weird, like about maybe three or four years ago where I hit like a point where I was like, oh, there are no cards in front of me and messages are coming out. Nice. Um, oh, wow. So a continuous like development. And then not long around the same time, and I don't know if, Sarah recounted the story or not, but she may have told you about how uh, she went through spiritual growths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and these are, are chaotic, crazy, weird things that uh, I hope no, no doesn't happen to people, but at the same time it does, um, where you basically feel like you have left your body for like a, a few months. <laughs> and it's, it's really chaotic and hectic and weird. And it feels like there's something wrong with your brain. And, um, it happened around summer uh, and I ran into Sarah luckily at this event that it, that were, or it was like the height of that peak of that sensation. And she did kind of like a little quick scan and she was like, oh, you're just going through a spiritual growth. What? And um, <laughs> she had gone through that. She had gone through that, but like she, she said, the best advice I can give you is don't resist, just allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. Because for her, she resisted and it lasted three months. Okay. How long did, um, how long did that last for you? um about a month about a month maybe almost a month and a half and uh, it is a horrifying terrifying experience I've, but at the same time it's it, it it helps i've heard people describing that as uh shedding veils i don't know if that's terminology you use but um, you know i have but i love that terminology that makes total sense actually yeah and just having yeah. to like relearn how to integrate yourself with this new knowledge that you have so it felt like you were just like like not in your own body or did you just feel like really weird internally? Um, this is the best way I can describe it. Think about the last time you were at a grocery store and then um, think about like being in the checkout aisle and getting your purse or whatever you need to check out. Now 
you know how that was a memory? Mm-hmm. Uh, imagine that, but it's in actual time. So you're there, but you're not there. Okay. It's almost like you've been there before, but you're literally physically there. I was literally teaching classes, doing interviews. Uh, we did a we did a lecture that day. Actually, the day I ran into Sarah, we did a lecture at uh, Austin Witch Fest, and I was like literally talking. And the whole time in my mind, I'm like, "How am I talking? How am I doing this? Oh my god, this, <laughs> you know, am I saying things correctly? You know?" And then at the end, everybody's like applauding. It's just it's a complete disconnect from uh, mind and body. And then wow, at the same time, you're like on a higher psychic level, and it's it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah to go through that I, I feel like i've had that feeling before for half a day or something but to have that happen for like weeks would be yeah really pretty terrible eric have, have, was, you had stories like this too i mean there have been moments where i feel kind of disconnected mm-hmm. but i always kind of like for me personally what i do and this works for me is i like to take little like spiritual breaks meaning i don't really engage like hardcore mm-hmm. right so i i definitely take a break to kind of re, not recharge because i'm always recharged well we we are always recharged practicing right sure um not approaching it so aggressively if that makes sense yeah I think aggressive mm-hmm. is a harsh word but yeah you know just take a little break here and there and then go back and you'll realize that okay by taking that break going back in now i'm now i'm experiencing everything with a fresh set of eyes and understanding that makes total sense to me yeah. i mean even you know, since Lauren and I have started engaging in, in our spiritual selves again, or actually paying attention, like we, I've had moments where I'm like, oh, like I'll meditate a lot one day or like get to a next level of meditation. And the next day I, to a certain extent, feel burnt out on it. Not that I'm not interested right. anymore, but it's almost like I spent my fuel and I need to like, yeah. yeah, keep working on the muscle. That's funny. And I also have yeah, exactly. had like a full day of like a feeling very dissociative. I, I remember one day in particular, uh, we weren't together yet. But I was doing a lot of meditating and stuff like that. And then I went to school the next day. I was in um, uh, audio engineering school. And I remember driving to school in Hollywood, which, you know, at the time I lived out here. So it took me like 45 minutes to get there. But when I parked, I was like, how did I get here? Oh, God. <laughs> Is it safe to drive? Should I not have driven? Yeah. 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 So, so I'm assuming that's like maybe that's my experience with that. Honestly, that's spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know how I safely traveled. <laughs> yeah. The scariest part that's was, um, so I, Sarah went through that, which it lasted a long time. Mm. She had to talk to uh, Elaine Ireland. I don't know if she mentioned Elaine. She Ireland. did. Yeah. She mentioned Elaine, yeah. yeah. So she talked to her and Elaine kind of have kind of helped her through it. So I had to talk to Elaine. And the scariest thing was Elaine was like, yeah, you'll get maybe like two or three in your lifetime. And I was like, oh, no, I have to go through this again. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> was it when you like felt like yourself again? Was it like a gradual process or or um, was it like one day you were just you felt you felt good again? It was definitely a gradual process. Yeah. I think the scariest part for me is like I, I consider myself an open minded skeptic. Mm-hmm. We, um, we like that. Here. Open-minded, definitely, you know, spiritual, but at the same time, skeptical. Yeah. So when things like this happen, I'm I'm looking for the scientific reason. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, you know, I, I, I see a therapist, which I actually recommend all my students to see therapists. Um, um, and my therapist, you know, I'm telling my therapist, like, well, I talked to a doctor and a doctor says that I'm, this may be early signs of dementia. Oh, geez. Uh, and my therapist is like, you're not having early signs of dementia. Like, he, like even he was like, you're not, you know, cause you're, he was like mental illness. And he was like, you're not, you're not mentally insane. Like there's, he's like, I know you, I've, you know, been in therapy for years with you. And he's like, you're going through something spiritual, just allow it to happen. Like, you know, your spiritual teachers say and, and write it basically. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty intense thing. And then when it was slowly going away, not only is it gradual, but, um, there's always that fear of like it, of falling back into it. Yeah. So there's like consistent, like, like, Oh God, I'm going to, I'm going to go back into that space again. So it was a very, very trying time for me. I assume it feels like having the like rug pulled out of under you and you having to, you're like, I've got a job and <laughs> I, have yeah. to, I have to operate still as a, as a human yeah. being. <laughs> That was the only the only good thing about it is you know we we run our own shop we 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 teach our own courses and so a lot of our own stuff is all all of, it's all on a spiritual level so it's okay to be in front of students and be like by the way uh, I'm going through spiritual growth I'm going to be fairly disconnected and there may be moments where I catch myself or you know things like those lines I mean that's such a nice position to be in 
That's such a nice position to be in. But on the other side of it, did you notice a big difference? Oh, I noticed a big difference afterwards. Yeah. But um, yeah, but like, I mean, because that's whenever I noticed like, oh, I don't need cards to get messages anymore. Okay. They just kind of pop. So yeah. There's definitely a heightened sensation, uh, feeling things more. Okay. Um, it's It's been a very, even like with Eric, when Eric does cleansing, this is one of the reasons I love when he does uh, workings. He, his guides kind of come through and channel messages to, to give to the, um, to the person he's cleansing. And that had never really been a thing for me. It was more so just kind of like my guides telling me what needs to be done and then getting it done. Hmm. But now it's more so like that. Like now, now they're starting to be like, oh, and let them know this, or just tell them this word, you know, and you tell them that word and then immediately like tears start oh, coming man. down there. Whoa. Um, because it's things they need to hear. It's things that that come through messages from their guides or their guardians. Well, I'm so curious, like how information comes in. You just hear like a word that you're like, I'm supposed to say this. You just know that. Yeah, I just like, I'm getting this. Yeah. Here's the word it comes out. You know, and wow. I know with Eric it's very different because Eric Eric picks up on that too, but he also has guides that speak through him, so he will literally get full blown sentences and stories and things that he has to tell clients wow before i get into this weird last question <laughs> how's the shop going great great <laughs> um we are consistently working i mean if if you know this you know you know you know this just from the amount of times we emailed back and forth um we're consistently working on something we're always adding things and changing things around um one of the reasons we opened up city alchemist was because uh oh, we always saw this people the story like Eric and I love to go shopping at various like witch shops and botanicas and things like that, but we couldn't find like the exact shop we wanted to shop at. So we kind of had to make it our own. That's so nice. You yeah, know, so that's great. we made our own shop, you know, um, and we're consistently adding things. We just, uh, we, we have an online school now that we we teach um, everything from curanderismo to necromancy to traditional witchcraft. Uh, we do online courses through our website as well. Um, we have a new class coming up that um, Eric is going to be orchestrating on candle magic. Um, we see clients. We do cleansings. Uh, we even do candle fixing, which is a little uh, more of a dying art in um, in the community around here, especially, which is basically where you get a seven-day uh, candle, uh, maybe like, for example, a road opening candle or a money candle. And we will add the oils and the, the powders and everything to it and fix it so that all you have to do is light it, set it and forget it, as they say. Um, I want one and, of those. Do you <laughs> ship to California if I want a candle? We yeah, absolutely do. Okay. Candle, um, candle fixing? Yes, we do. Candle fixing. Candle fixing, or they call it velas compuestas is what it's called in like Spanish. Okay. Um, or velas preparadas is another word, which like means prepared candles. So you threw out a term real quick, and I want to make sure because I, uh, <laughs> what is necromancy? Because <laughs> when I think I necromancy, I, I I have played a lot of Skyrim, and I'm thinking of like just bringing zombies back. Like <laughs> so, I'm I'm sure it's not that. Yeah, I often refer to myself as a modern day necromancer, mm -hmm. and the reason for that is because necromancy is essentially working with the dead, either through communication or through spiritual interaction. Okay. Um, that's my definition of it, at least. So, uh, a lot of these traditions, even like Santeria and another Cuban Congo based tradition known as Palo Mayombe, uh, and then a Brazilian tradition that we practice, which is called Kimbanda, these are all uh, necromantic practices, meaning that they are um, practices that communicate and work with spirits. Okay. Um, when you think necromancy, yes, your mind immediately goes to medieval times of bringing forth corpses yeah. and making a skull talk and all kinds of things. <laughs> yes. but, uh, but modern day necromancy is more so uh, being able to connect with um, spirits in all their forms, whether it be a human spirit, an animal spirit, um, a spirit of nature, and being able to work with that spirit. So, for example, in Bala Mayombe, which is very similar to Santeria, they have very similar connections. It's just more uh, Congo-based as opposed to Nigerian-based. We believe that every object, plant, tree, I mean, it's animism, right? Everything has spirit. And so uh, we have the ability to work with those spirits in order to make things happen. So, for example, um, whenever we need a spiritual bath, we don't just grab some basil and some rosemary 
and say, well, it's been, this is supposed to clean you. So here you go. Just put yourself with this bath. We grab basil and rosemary because those are spirits themselves. And one of them is a spirit of healing and one of them is a spirit of cleansing. And another one may be a spirit of removing negativity. And so by macerating those spirits all together into life force, which is water, we are literally creating a, uh, a new spirit, if you will, that is going to cleanse and remove the negativity from our body. So it's not just a simple add this, add that, you're done. It's a ceremony. It is a tradition. It is a way of connecting with the spirits of everything to create some form of action or magic. And you're creating a new spirit through combining these spirits and, and combined with your intention. Yes, absolutely. And that's something that we do in follow. Um, we create what are called brendas or gangas. Uh, even in Kimbanda, they're called asentamentos. And they are essentially a combination of a main spirit that we're working with. Or in in in, um, in follow, they call them muerto, which literally means a death or a dead. Um, and then we combine them with animal, plant, mineral, all these things that have their own spirit into one giant um, spiritual pot, essentially which is called an asentamento in, in Brazil or a, um, a, a prenda in, in, um, in Cuba. And by doing that, now we have a very powerful natural force that is not only a human spirit, but is a human spirit that is now combined with the essences of nature spirits. Okay. Okay. It's kind of like... <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Again, I, I got kids. It sounds kind of like uh, Elsa's like big... <laughs> ice monster thing but like you know it was friendly it helped her out it really uh, what a bad example and they can be friendly <laughs> that's the thing is that follow gets a follow gets a big stigma for being a dark religion because they use things like human bones and sure work with spirits but um, essentially a follow but that can be used to heal someone just as much as it can be used to hurt them mm. so uh it really is it does lie in the heart of the person who is the practitioner mm. Um, one of the things we talk about in our in our brujeria book, Blood of Brujeria, is that witchcraft, like dark magic, essentially exists not just because we want to hurt people for fun. It's mostly because sometimes the law is not on our side. So what better way to do to have that justice than to call in the spirit to make sure that our justice is is uh, taken into account? Gotcha. So it's in the uh, it's in the eye of the necromancer, as they say, as the common <laughs> saying, as everyone says. <laughs> common phrase alexis uh there was an episode of the night owl podcast um that was pretty impactful to me and you were present i remember you played a big role in it you had to i remember you were gathering a bunch of um i think you were hitting a drum and you had a bunch of herbs and all this stuff and you said you were working with the spirits of of the land to kind of bring like a homeostasis back to this house that had kind of fallen out of balance yeah i think that was the if i'm not mistaken that's the murder house episode i think it was called um, the murder house yeah that sounds right yeah, that was a very, very intense case for us. Um, yeah, it sounded nuts. You know, Stephen and I, yeah, Stephen and I have, have been friends since college, and we've been very interested in this for a very long time. We joke around a lot. Like, there's so much unedited stuff that does not make it into the podcast. Most of it is pretty much the same jokes you've been doing, like, today. Like, it's, like, all that. You know, we just make stupid jokes all yeah, the time. Yeah, and laugh. that's what I'm about. Stupid funny. Um, when we left that house for the first time, we were silent. Oof. Like we, we had no jokes, no wisecracks. We were just stunned with how um, how horrible it was that the people that had died there and then just the, uh, the energy in the space was just as bad. So one of the things we had to do or I had to do was create a ceremony to kind of bring that energy back um, because there were some good like energies just like just just shy of where the land kind of ended mm. um so we had to do a ceremony to bring forth the energies back so that we could basically let the spirits know the land spirits the good spirits the native spirits that this home needs blessings again because of all the horrible things that have happened there and you know you know this when you go to a place where maybe somebody has died or somebody was killed there's a feeling, there's a weird feeling in the air or it just seems off. Um, that's what that is. It's it's the house itself has uh, been impacted by the things that have happened there. So you have to uh, kind of reset um, the land and reset the house so that um, good energy can kind of start flowing back through it. Someone who doesn't have your 
knowledge and skill set. Let's say you're my, so my dad, he flips homes and he's like experienced some things. He, he I think he has a, a level of intuition that he hasn't quite acknowledged yet. But that said, like, is there any like basic cleansing or do you really kind of need to know what you're doing and bring in a, a, an expert? Cause I know everyone, you know, I have Palo Santo here. I heard, I, I never even knew about Palo Santo until I, I listened to you talk about it. And then uh, I also have Sage and stuff, but same thing. Like I'm not an expert. I can light it up and like do all the stuff, but I, I, I'm not. And like have a crystal here and there. Yeah, I got but... a crystal. I got, I got a, I got a crystal right here, yeah. <laughs> but I, <laughs> it's me kind of going through the motions to a certain extent because I don't fully understand it. So I don't know. Is there anything that like your average, average Joe can do, or is it just better to get a pro? For basic. Like, um, you know, the house is feeling a little off. Absolutely. Palo Santo, Sage, you know, whatever those things you want to use to, to kind of clear the energy is totally fine. If it's more advanced than that, if you're dealing with, for example, like a situation like the murder house mm -hmm. um, where there were multiple murders in one space or, um, you know, even a, a space where there just seems to be a lot of horrible ex spiritual activity. It's really good to find a practitioner, a genuine practitioner who can go in and kind of gauge the situation because um it's kind of like something that we say in curanderismo not all the cures are the same mm. you know uh, if we have a line of people outside uh to get cleansings you know eric and i will do cleansings for example for the for the public we do public cleansings we're not using the same thing on every single person you know right. we're taking a quick peek, doing a really quick analysis and being like okay this is what we need to use on this person the medicine's always going to change depending on the on the person and de depending on the location so it is going to require a bigger person usually for like a really bigger job now in the case of your father who you said is like flip home flips homes mm. i would actually recommend like before he even like starts working on a property to just do a very simple introduction hi i am so and so i'm just here to beautify this home and make it beautiful again so that someone else is going to come here and take care of it. And then you can offer a little sage or something to the land tobacco, even as an offering and saying like, I'm sorry for any other things that may have happened on this spatial location. I was not present for that. I'm just here to fix and beautify this space. Oh, I love that so much. Nice. I love, yeah. I love making peace with, with, with a space and just like treating it with respect. And I feel like yeah. that's so important. That's so and, nice. and any yeah energy that's there. Like they're not feeling encroached upon or like pissed that you're coming to knock down a wall here or there, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And also just even hearing you describe it, like that sounds something that like anybody can do. Like you can go in and do that and like just thanking, thanking a space for, you know, allowing you to engage with it. It just sounds like something you should be doing anyway. I was going to say, we have a tendency to believe that when we buy something, it's ours. Yeah. Right. Um, but the land and everything else that was there before was was there before we were. Right. So that's not capitalism. Come on, Alexis. <laughs> I own all my stuff. <laughs> no, I think that's an amazing point. Yeah. When you say that you do a cleansing for someone and you take a little peek, are you is it like their aura, their energy? Like, what are you are you tapping into like their brain, their past lives, their life? Like, what is it? Eric, I would say it's all of the above, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think it's difficult to um, really pinpoint it because every medium, every curandero, curandera is different. It's really hard to explain it, honestly. It's just for me, I just I just say I'm tapping into the current. I'm tapping into their, their current, their, their energy. Yeah, but I think that energy is a loaded term, right? It's just, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really begin to describe what really is going on. Right. My last big question, which I kind of mentioned in the um, email that I sent you, was that our trusted family psychic, who I, I lovingly refer to uh, in the fake name of Dr. Claire, because we're not outing him. He's told me a few times, he's like, he's like, I don't know what's up, but like you have an envy issue. I'm like, I don't really like, sure. I mean, I see somebody with a nice car on occasion. I'm like, that's a nice car. Like, I, I can't afford that. But but he says like, oh, your envy is a big deal. And I was like, what are you talking about? So recently I had COVID and he said that basically my ADD brain was calm enough to, that he can like read it a little bit better. And he said, oh, you you smell like Santeria. You smell like you inherited someone else's envy. So he he thinks that I have a slight envy curse. I don't even know if that's a thing, but um, I believe him. <laughs> 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 yeah. Is it a thing? 
It is a thing. That is something we talk about in our books, actually. Oh, really? There is a form of sickness in, that we refer to in Coronavirismo as envidia. Huh. Um, and envidia is just whenever... Um, it's, it's one of two things. It's either someone has been envious of you and therefore um, they have placed like a, a curse on you, not purposefully, mm -hmm. but just because they're envious of the things that you have. Okay. And then the other one is that, you know, they, they purposefully were like sending that energy toward you. Mm -hmm. But there's also um, some people do it naturally. So for example, they may have the NVIDIA themselves and they give it to people on accident uh, because they already have that, that ability to do that essentially. Uh, you may see this a lot with like what we call evil eye, right? Mal de ojo. Immediately like touch a child or touch like somebody on the head when they say, oh, they're so beautiful and they touch their head because they don't want them to get the evil eye. Uh -huh. It's it's the same. Thing. You're envious of the fact that they have beautiful hair. You're envious of the fact that they have a beautiful face or they have gorgeous eyes. So we we touch them as a way of connecting ourselves to them and saying, don't send anything to them, though. Don't connect, like send any envy to them. I'm okay with the fact that they have beautiful eyes or a beautiful face. Um, so that is something. But now the Santeria part of that, I'm not too sure. That's something that you would have to ask Eric about. Eric, any insights? Um, I was specifically told that it was someone who is envious, not necessarily of me, but of someone else in my family. And it came to me because it couldn't get to that person that it was originally intended to go to. I'm being very vague right now because I'm not trying to out anybody. <laughs> but my assumption, just from hearing about it a little bit, was that it may have been on accident, but maybe not. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely possible, right? We can't just really um, say that that's not something that might happen. As far as the Santeria context, I mean, if you have experience in the spiritual practice and religion, a really knowledgeable elder would be able to help you with that issue. So as far as like being passed on or, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just kind of um, trying to understand it a little bit better. I've never heard of something like that. But again, I'm not saying that that does not exist. Sure. Because anything's possible. Yeah. Yeah, trust me, I've never heard of it either. And I never uh, assumed I would. I keep telling Lauren, I'm like, I'm cursed. You don't want nothing to do with me, babe. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I think that that's. I'm a big advocate for Santeria. I think it does, deserves respect. Sure. So to be quite honest with you, I don't feel like that's something that's that we can blame on Santeria. Yeah, I would more or less blame it on someone's intentions or deep envy that ricocheted onto me. Sure. Which, you know, I'm, I'm a big. Yeah. I'm always going to talk about intentions. I think it's something people don't mm -hmm. discuss enough. Yeah. Let's assume this was just an uh, unintentional, but like maybe I received someone's deep envy. What what would you recommend as maybe a first step for me to, to maybe clear that in some way? Well, if the medium specifically told you it was ancestral, I would definitely encourage you to set up some sort of elevation for your ancestors, for sure. What do you mean by I elevation? Feel like, um, so that way they're understanding that even in the spirit world, you're able to elevate your consciousness, right? To be able to say that I don't have to have this frame of thinking anymore. Oh. I don't have to be envious in the spirit world. I don't I don't have to have envy with me. And by doing that, you start clearing up that issue. So I don't think this is a Santeria aspect. I think it's more ancestral. Okay. And I think that um, that would probably be something for a different podcast, honestly, because there's a there's a practice in Cuba and Latin America in general called spiritism, the spiritismo. So it's working with those types of spirits and energies. Okay. But for you, I would recommend definitely just do some elevation for your ancestors, praying for them, praying for their clarity for sure. Okay. That kind of checks out with some other stuff I'm supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're supposed to be diving pretty, pretty deep into your ancestral history. yeah there's, uh, there's mm -hmm. maybe some like latent psychic abilities on my side of the family that i might have uh i've been too busy to pay attention to so i'm trying to <laughs> fix that <laughs> yeah for you i i i'm honestly feeling it's more ancestral more uh more of that elevation work that we've been talking about you know there's a saying that alexis and i really follow is that you heal yourself you also heal your ancestors ah yes that also checks out with something else i was told recently okay yeah yeah. This is great. That's so helpful. <laughs> Healing generational trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Exactly. It's yeah. party, party time. <laughs> Guys, Eric Alexis, you are awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to tell people about any of your, your practices or your work or where they can find your books? You can find our books pretty much anywhere. They're on Amazon. They're uh, pretty much all over the place. Um, 
we sell them through our website. When we do get them, we do sell out of them uh, because we signed them. Uh, Amazing. And um, well, we do get them in. We'll probably have them in a few weeks, more likely. Nice. Uh, but you can get it with us. Uh, you can always find us at City Alchemist uh, in our Instagram, City Alchemist, or um, um, Facebook Messenger, anywhere. You can always reach out to us. We try to get back to you as soon as we can, or just email us at info at cityalchemist.co. Um, and we are the kind of people that are, if we can't find the answer, we're going to find somebody for you that will. Um, we don't believe in just being like, nap, nah, sorry, we can't do that. You know, um, mm -hmm. we're going to try to find somebody and, and help you out in some way. When when it's just like the podcast, we're never just going to leave you high and dry. Uh, last words, I would just say, you know, don't be discouraged by the, you know, social media can be a really good thing for practitioners, but it can also be a, a curse because there's so many people out there that are saying this is the right way and this is the wrong way and right. so on and yeah. so forth. Look for, look for good, proper teachers. Uh, that's probably really, really important. If you can't find a proper teacher, reach out to us and we'll find somebody who we think would be perfectly suited to you. That's amazing. Thank you both so much for giving us your time today. I might follow up more on the elevation for <laughs> ancestors thing because yeah. that's interesting. You got to talk to Eric now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a journey. <laughs> I have a journey. I got to stop getting distracted. We're in the middle of like, we have like three weddings to go to over the, or we just went to a wedding last week and we got two more weddings coming up. But I'm in one of them. Lauren's in one of them. So it's just like, I'm also trying to like, you know, awaken my, my ability to be spiritual again. It's a lot to tackle. So yeah, we understand. It's harder when you actually run the spiritual business as well. So. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure you guys burn out sometimes. You're just like, I don't want to talk about this right now. Let's, yeah. let's watch football or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much again. Thank uh, and you. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. We'd like to thank our newest supporter, Gargantua. <laughs> okay. G <laughs> Gargantua. <laughs> Gargantua Jones Borb Jr. bought us some. <laughs> Gargantua Jones boy. <laughs> I can't do it. Gargantua Jones Borb Jr. bought us some coffees. Thank you, Gargantua. Thank you for listening. Visit www.clairvoyaging.com for show notes, merch, or just to say hi. If you'd like to support our journey, visit www.buymeacoffee.com backslash clairvoyaging. This has been a production of Wayfeather Media.